you have your Bibles, let's turn together, if you would please, to Psalm 105. Psalm 105. You're familiar with the history of the nation of Israel. You remember that after the reign of King Saul was ended, King Saul died in battle. And you remember the Lord already had a man in the, in, the, in the side there waiting to step onto the stage, and that was, of course, David. And so you remember how that David comes, and, and for seven years he rules over a portion of the nation of Israel in a place called Hebron. And he, he rules over just a couple of tribes. But then there came the day when David took the rule over the entire nation. He begins to rule over the entire nation, and as the king of the entire nation, all 12 tribes now are, are under his reign, and therefore his desire was to, his desire is to bring the ark of God. He wants to bring the ark of God, which had been captured by the Philistines before. And he wants to move the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom that was located near to kerjath Jerem. And he wants to move it from there and he wants to take it to Jerusalem, his capital city. And so, and so David's desire is to bring the ark of God to the place that, that he has prepared in Jerusalem. He's prepared a tent there for, for, the, for the ark of God. And so we pick up the history of this. If you, if, if you look back to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse number 1, the Bible says they brought the ark of God set it in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it, and they offered burnt sacrifices and burnt and peace offerings before God. And so with, 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 with this great amount of worship to the Lord, they, they now bring the ark of God and they bring it to this place that David has prepared in the city of Jerusalem. And it's during that time, it's in that setting, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 7 tells us that on that day, David delivered first this psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. So, so this psalm that we're looking at today, actually, if we compare the two scriptures, if we compare the psalm recorded in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 8 down to verse number 36, if we compare that with what we're going to see in our text today, what you will notice is that Psalm 105 is actually an expanded version. It's an expanded version of the Psalm David first wrote when the Ark of God was brought into the city of Jerusalem. Now you'll remember, you remember in the last Psalm, uh, we saw the opening chapters of the book of Genesis were referred to. And the story of the creation. Uh, David referred to those, to those early chapters in the book of Genesis. Now in this psalm, he's going to continue the story by actually speaking of the nation of Israel's history. He, he's going to refer to their history. And, and it's going to basically, uh, he's going to be continuing the story that, that ends with the book of Genesis, but then continues on through the book of Exodus, through the book of Leviticus, through the book of Numbers. He, he's going to be referring to that time in the history of nation uh, uh, of, of the nation of Israel. And, and all of this, all of this is designed for a purpose. And all of this is designed to show the goodness and to show the faithfulness of the Lord God. That's what, what, that's what he's going to do. He's going to show the goodness. He's going to show the faithfulness of the Lord God. And so David, as the writer of this psalm, on the occasion of bringing the ark of God into the city of Jerusalem, putting it in the place that he had prepared, David now takes up his pen and he begins to write. And I want us to notice a couple of things that we find as we go through this psalm together. First of all, there is Israel's exhortation. There is Israel's exhortation. In other words, David is going to exhort the nation of Israel. He's going to, he's going to call the nation of Israel. Uh, he's going to call upon them to give five things to the Lord God. He, he's going to call on them to give five things to the Lord God. First of all, he's going to call on them to give thanks. He, he wants them to give thanks to the Lord God. Notice it in verse number one. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Call 
upon His name. And, and so it begins with an exhortation that, that as the people of God, they ought to express their thanksgiving to God. They, they ought to give thanks to Him. Uh, not only are they to give thanks, they're also to give witness. They're to give a witness. Uh, verse number one continues. Not only does he want them to give thanks, but he says this in verse number one. He says, make known his deeds among the people. Make known his deeds among the people. Now there are two ways that this could be done. There are two ways that making the deeds of God known uh, uh, among the people. And by the way, the phrase there, the people, that's referring to the nation of Israel. It's God's chosen people that he's specifically speaking to. And, and, so, and so he says, make known his deeds. Two ways they can do that. First of all, they can do it through, through singing. They, they can do it through their singing. They can also do it through their talking. Through their talking. And, and therefore, David continues, verse number two, he says, sing unto him. Sing unto Him. Uh, sing psalms unto Him. Talk ye of all His wondrous works. Sing psalms to God and tell other people of all that God has done. Tell God, other people, of all of God's wonderful, wonderful works. And, and so He encourages them to give thanks. He encourages them to give, to give a witness. And then He also encourages them to give praise. To give praise. Uh, verse number three. Glory ye in His holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. To rejoice. To give praise to God. Not just thanking Him, but praising Him for all of the wonderful things that He has done. But, but then there's another thing that David encourages them to give, and that is this. Uh, he encourages them to give preference to give preference. In, in other words, the encouragement is simply that God's people, the nation of Israel, would, would truly make God to be the number one priority in their lives. To be the number one priority in their nation. That, that, that's the desire that is seen here. Notice it in verse number 4. He says, Seek ye the Lord. That, that is not a passive thing. It's an active thing. To seek. In other words, have a great desire to find. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face forevermore. Seek His face forevermore. To have the preference. Finding God's strength. Finding God's assistance. Finding God's presence. That's what it means when it says seek His face. Simply means to look and to seek for His presence, to desire nothing more than to have the presence of the Lord God dwelling in their midst. And then there was this one. There's this one. He encourages them to also give consideration. To give consideration. In, in, in other words, in all of the activities of life that seem so quickly to dominate our thinking, all of the things that so quickly seem to dominate what we think about, all of that, uh, David's admonition is, think about him. Think about him. Notice it in verse 5 and verse number 6. Remember, remember his marvelous works that he hath done. Remember his wonders. Remember the judgments of his mouth. O ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. And so, and so David gives to the nation of Israel, he, he admonishes them, he exhorts them to give to the Lord these five things that, that we find mentioned here. And, and we need to understand that Israel could do all of this. This was not an unrealistic expectation. It's not an unrealistic request. Israel could actually do all of these things simply because of their confidence. Israel's confidence. Israel's confidence was based in the promises of God. That's a key point. All of their, it wasn't based in their own strength. It wasn't based in their military powers. It wasn't based in their wealth and all of those other things. No, their, their confidence was absolutely based in the promises of God. 
It's based in what God has promised. So David now, he, he's going to actually begin to speak of what we would call the Abrahamic covenant. He's going to begin to speak of that Abrahamic covenant. In other words, he's going to, he's going to remind Israel of the, of the national promises. The national promises that God had made to Abraham concerning his seed, concerning his children. And, and there's four things that David is going to mention as he, as he talks about this Abrahamic covenant. First of all, he's going, to, he's going to present it in the light of God's sovereignty. He's going to present it in the light of God's sovereignty. In verse number 7, He is the Lord our God. Boy, that's a great statement. He is the Lord our God. His judgments. What does that mean? It simply means His plans, His purposes, His verdicts concerning all things. His judgments are in all of Israel. Is that what it says? No, that's not what it says. It's in all the earth. You, you see, there is no place in this world where God is not in control. We, we see places that seem out of control. And yet the reality is God is in absolute control in His sovereignty. His judgments are in all the earth. That's the sovereignty of God. What a great foundation to build upon. The sovereignty of God. But not only do we see God's sovereignty, we also see God's sincerity. God's sincerity. Notice it in verse number 8. He hath remembered His covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations. He, he's remembered his covenant. For how long? Somebody talk to me. Forever. Yeah. And, and then more specifically for a, how many generations? A thousand generations. Now, now there you, you read different commentators. Different commentators have different ideas. Uh, about what this means. Uh, from, from the commentaries that I have read, it seems that the general consensus is that this generation was a generation that lasted 20 years. So you have a thousand generations, each one 20 years. 20 years. However, however, think about this. Even if one generation was only 10 years in length, a thousand generations times Ten years would equal 10,000 years. It would equal 10,000 years. And what is the relevance of that? What's the importance of that? Well, if you go back and you study the biblical records, it seems pretty clear from the biblical records, the biblical genealogies, that, that this earth that we live on, this ball of dirt that we call home, Regardless of what you hear in the science books about billions and billions and billions of years ago, far, far away, there was an explosion. By the way, do you, you, you know what you, you know, you grow up, you know this. When they start talking about something many, many years ago in a land far away, you know you're fixing to hear a fairy tale, right? Yeah, well, that's kind, of what, that's kind of what you get these days. Billions a year. No, actually, from the biblical records and the genealogies, it's pretty apparent that this ball we call earth, it's only about 6,000 years old. Now, if God's promises are good for 10,000 years, if His promises are certain and sure for 10,000 years, if it's good for a thousand generations, it's not speaking of a specific period of time. Rather, it's simply speaking of a period of time that is indefinite. It's an indefinite period of time. And that certainly fits the Hebrew style of poetry. The, the forever the forever we find at the beginning of the verse carries the same idea, carries the same meaning as the thousand generations that are found at the end of the verse. They mean exactly the same thing. Bottom line, bottom line, God's promises are sincere in that they will never be broken. The passing of time means nothing to our eternal God. His promises are sure. His promises are settled and they will never 
never, never be broken. That's the promise that God has given to Israel. That's the promise that God has given to them. God's sovereignty, God's sincerity. Notice we also find God's selectivity. Selectivity. Now there are some who say that the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. There are some who will say that those blessings have now been taken away from Israel because Israel rejected their Messiah. They, they rejected the one whom God had promised and whom God in His faithfulness had sent to them. They, they had rejected Him. They, they had declared, we will not have this man to rule over us. Not only did they reject Him, they had Him crucified. And so there are some who will say that because of Israel's rejection, God's promises to them has been, has been transferred. It has been transferred from the nation of Israel to the New Testament church. That all of God's promises to Israel as a people have been transferred to the New Testament period and to the church. However, the reality is there is no place for such a hermeneutic. There, there's no place for such an interpretation of Scripture to be found anywhere because God's choice in this matter has been made abundantly, perfectly clear. God's choice has been made perfectly clear. Notice it in our text, verse 9 and verse number 10. Which covenant, talking about the covenant, this Abrahamic covenant, concerning the people, concerning the land, he says, which covenant he made with Abraham? and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law. And to Israel as a nation, he gave it to Israel for an everlasting covenant. It's an everlasting covenant. God made it very clear. He made it very specific. This is for the people he had chosen. This is for the nation of Israel. He gave the covenant to Abraham. He, he then went beyond that and, and he gave the oath. He confirmed it with, with Isaac and then, and then confirmed it again with Jacob. And, then, and now he's passed it to all of the people through his holy word. He's given to them his wonderful promise. He's given to them his wonderful promise that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their seed, that covenant will never be taken away. It will never be transferred to somebody else. Because folks, if that were a possibility, then we could not honestly say it was an everlasting covenant, could we? We would have to say it's a temporary covenant. It's, it's only temporary. It's only temporary. And if that is true, if, that, if it is only a temporary thing that has been rescinded and taken away from God's chosen people and given to somebody else, if that is true, can I put it real blunt? God has not kept His word and He's guilty of lying. Is that clear enough? Yeah. If God hasn't done what He said He was going to do, and if he is not still doing what he said he would do, then God has failed to keep his word, and therefore he is really not God. He's really not God. Notice letter D. God's specifics. God's specifics. Verse number 11. Saying, here's what he said, saying unto thee, to who? Well, go back to the previous verses, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to, to the people of Israel. Here's what he said. Here's what he said. Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance. The lot of your inheritance. In other words, the nation of people that would come from them. God's given that to them. God's given that to them. Uh, and, and you find it clearly stated, Deuteronomy 32, verse number 9. It's clearly stated. While the promise was made to the children of Israel, they were made to the children of Israel while they were serving cruel taskmasters in the land of Egypt. They were serving cruel taskmasters during that time. And, and, and yet notice it, verse number 12, when they were but a few men in number, yea, very few, you remember the record? There's only 70 people back then. 
There's only 70 people that went down into Egypt. And, and, and there were very few in number. And, and they were strangers. In other words, they owned nothing in Egypt. They owned nothing there. I think Spurgeon said it very well. Here's what he said. He said, the blessings promised to the seed of Abraham were not dependent upon the number of his descendants or their position in this world. And by the way, God's promises to us are exactly the same way. They're not dependent on how many people we have in church. And they're not dependent on how, what position we may have in the eyes of the world. Uh, God's promises are not dependent on any of those things. God's promises are dependent only on one thing, and that is His eternal faithfulness. That's it. His eternal faithfulness. Israel's confidence was based on the Lord's God's promises. But then I want you to notice this. We, saw, we see Israel's protection. Israel's protection. Before the promises concerning the land of Canaan would be fulfilled, before those promises would actually be realized, there was, a, there was a period of testing that Israel would have to endure. But before the promises would be realized, there was a time of difficulty, there was a time of testing that Israel would have to endure. And even though God allowed them to be sorely tested, the wonderful truth is, as you read the record, even though He allowed them to be sorely tested, they were never outside of His protective care. He allowed them to be tested. He allowed them to face some hard times. But they were never outside of His care. They were never outside of His care. Now, notice in verse 13, 14, and 15. When they went from one nation to another... From one kingdom unto another people. In other words, they went down from, they left Canaan, they go down to Egypt. He suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Touch not mine anointed. Don't touch the people that I have chosen. These are my chosen people. This is my chosen. Don't you touch them. Don't touch mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. And then David is going to give us a couple of illustrations. He's going to illustrate this great truth by calling to the witness stand a couple of men. First of all, he's going to call the witness stand the man by the name of Joseph. Man by the name of Joseph. This, this was a man who came to Egypt just before, just before there was a time of, uh, of crisis. We're reminded of that crisis. In, in verse number 16, uh, moreover, he, that's the Lord God, called for a famine upon the land. By the way, did you notice that? Did you notice that? The famine, where did it come from? God called for it, it, it was something God ordained. It was something that God brought. Uh, he, he called for a famine upon the land and He break the whole staff of bread. In other words, He calls for the famine. Result, there's no food. There's no food. And there are three things we're told about this period in Joseph's life. First of all, we're told about His arrival. His arrival. In verse 17 and verse 18. He sent a man before them. They're fixing to go through a very difficult time and God's going to send someone before them. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. Now you remember the story. You remember the story of Joseph. He was sold, first of all, by his brothers in Genesis 37, verse number 28. He was sold by his brothers to a group of traders, some Midianites. And, and then you remember the Midianites took him down into Egypt. They sold him to a fellow by the name of Potiphar, uh, Genesis 39, verse number 1. And, and so here's this man, God is sent, and, and he was sent as a, he sent as a servant. He sold into slavery. He sold into slavery. Verse number 18, whose feet they hurt with fetters. And he was laid in iron. Uh, you remember the story how that, how that Potiphar 
has Joseph imprisoned. Genesis 39, verse number 20. He has Joseph in prison for a crime that he did not commit. He, he's totally innocent. And, and yet he's locked up in the prison house. Locked up in the prison house. That's his arrival in Egypt. Why in the world did God allow that to happen? Why, why did God allow that to happen? Well, it's because of the fact that before any man is ever greatly used of God, that man must first of all go through a period of testing. It, it's, it's true in every case. Uh, I, I love to read the biographies of, of men who have been greatly used of God in the past, and it's always amazing to notice how that those men who have been used the most have been tested the most. They've been tested the most. And so it was with Joseph. God has sent him down, and, and, and he's not there in a pleasant set of circumstances. And, and the reason is simply because there was a time now that he would have to face his testing. His testing. Before Israel would enter into the promised land, the Lord God allowed them to be tested. And before the Lord God promotes a man to a place of authority, He allows that man to be tested. And therefore the Bible tells us in verse 17, 18, 19 concerning Joseph, who was sold for a servant by his brothers and by the Midianites, whose feet they hurt with fetters. They laid him in irons. Excuse me, until the time, until the time, until the time. Did you notice that? Until the time. It's not permanent. It's, it's a temporary thing. God allowed this time of testing until, until, until the time that His Word came, the Word of the Lord tried him. And because Joseph passed the test, because Joseph passed the test without murmuring, he passed the test without complaining against God. Then we find his promotion. His promotion. Verse 20 and following. The king sent and loosed him. Even the ruler of the people let him go free. Not only did he give him freedom, notice this. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance, to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his senators wisdom. To teach his senators wisdom. All of this, Joseph is promoted over everything. He's given the rule over everything. You remember the story? The, the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, said, I alone will be greater than you in all of the kingdom. You're number two man. You're number two man. His promotion. And so we give the, we find the illustration is given, first of all, of, uh, of Joseph. And then we find there's also the illustration given concerning, concerning Israel. Concerning Israel. Now you remember Israel. His first name was Jacob. His first name was Jacob. But you remember Jacob had an encounter with the Lord God. There was that, that wrestling match with the Lord God. And, and as a result of that, you remember Jacob's name is changed. His name is changed to Israel, a prince with God, the Lord God said. Yeah, his name is changed to Israel. And of course, Israel then becomes the father uh, uh, of Joseph. He becomes the father of Joseph. And so here's what it says in verse 23 and following Israel. Uh, that is now a reference to all of the children of Israel. Jacob's children. Genesis 46, verse 5 to 7. All of them now came also into Egypt. And Jacob... That's the man himself. Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. And he, that's the Lord God, increased his people greatly, made them stronger than their enemies. That's why, that's why the Pharaoh wanted to do away with the children of Israel. Because they're becoming stronger. And they're afraid that Israel, these people, will turn against him. And, and so that's why he seeks to begin to weaken them by having all of the male children killed at birth. You remember the story. You remember the story. And, and, so, and so he made he made them stronger than their enemies. He turned their heart to hate his people, to deal subtly, that is deceitfully, with his servants. And you know the story. 
How that there comes that period of ten plagues. Those ten plagues come upon the land of Egypt and how that, how that we find that Pharaoh says, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll, 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 I'll let you go, but don't go too far. I'll let you go, but don't take everybody with you. Uh, in, in other words, they begin to deal deceitfully and ten times God sends these plagues and finally with the tenth one, with the tenth one, their hearts are totally humbled before God. And the people of Israel are released. Here, here's the thing I want us to notice. Here's the thing David is reminding us here. And that's this. Sometimes God allows the world to hate us. Sometimes God allows the world to mistreat us. Why does God allow that? Why is it He doesn't care about us? No, 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 not at all. I believe God allows the world to hate us. He allows us to suffer persecution from the world is simply so that we, as His people, do not become too comfortable with this world. That we do not become too comfortable in the world. That's exactly what the Lord God did for the people of Israel. He's preparing them with all of their difficulties, with all of the trials and all of their testings. He's preparing them so that when the time came, when the time came, they would be ready to leave Egypt. They would be ready to go. And so we find then number four, God's deliverance. Or Israel's deliverance. And, and we find his, his deliverance. And, and there's a couple of things that it, David is going to remind us about. First of all, he's going to remind us about God's judgments. About God's judgments. Let's read several verses here together, beginning in verse number 26. He sent Moses his servant, and Aaron whom he had chosen. And they showed his signs among them, that is among the people, among the people of Egypt, the wonders in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made it dark. And they rebelled not against His word. He turned their waters into blood and slew their fish. Their land brought forth frogs in abundance in the chambers of their kings. He spake, and there were divers sorts of flies. That simply means there's all different kinds of flies. And lice in all their coasts. He gave them hail for rain and flaming fire in their land. He smote their vines also and the fig trees. He brake the trees of their coast. He spake and the locusts came, the caterpillars, and that without number. And did eat up all the herbs of their land and devoured the fruit of their ground. He smote also all the firstborn in their land, the chief of all their strength. Those were God's judgments on the nation of Israel. Or on the nation of Egypt, I'm sorry. That, that's God's judgments upon the nation of, of Egypt. But not only do we see His deliverance through His judgments upon the nation of Egypt, we also see His spoiling. His spoiling. Uh, verse number 37, He brought them forth also. That's what about the nation of Israel. He's going to bring them out of the land of Egypt. He brings them forth. He brought them forth, how does it say? With silver and gold. And there was not one feeble person among all the tribes. In other words, all of them are healthy from the youngest to the oldest. All of them are healthy. All of them are ready to go. They're able to go. There's none who are feeble among all the people. And when they leave, they basically leave with the wealth of Egypt in their pocket. God bless them. God bless them. He spoils the nation of Egypt. And because of all the Lord God had done to Egypt, the Bible says this, verse number 38, Egypt was glad when they departed. I visited someone one time. They had a little plaque in their house. And their plaque said, All of our company brings joy. All of our, all of our company, all of our guests, they, they all bring joy. And then it said, Some when they come, and some when they go. You've had guests like that at your house too? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. All, all of them bring joy. Some when they come, some, some when they leave, you're real happy about it. Well, 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 Egypt was glad when Israel came down and they were made servants and slaves. But now after God's judgments, they're ready for Israel to get out of town. They're ready for Israel to leave. Egypt was glad when they departed. And, and here's why they're glad. It's because the fear of them fell upon them. They're not just afraid of Israel as a people, they're afraid of Israel's God. Because through those ten plagues, the God of Israel has proved His superiority over all the gods of Egypt. He's proven His power, His superiority over all of them. And so the people, they're glad. They're glad when Israel departed. Not only do we see, not only do we see Israel's deliverance, we see the judgments and the spoiling, but, but we also see his direction. His direction, verse number 39, he spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give light in the night. You remember the story, how that Israel, as they come out of the land of Egypt, as they're crossing that Sinai Peninsula, how, how that God himself, like a pillar of cloud, leads them in the daytime. And I'm convinced that pillar of cloud actually uh, spread over them and protected them from the, from the sun and, and, and it led them, it protected them. And, and then at night, it was like a pillar of fire that gave light and, and again gave direction as, as they make their way. God's leading them. He's guiding His people in a most miraculous way. And, and not only does He give provision, uh, notice or protect, uh, direction, He also gives provision. He gives provision. Psalm 105, verse 40 and verse number 41, the people asked, and He brought quails, satisfied with them with the bread of heaven. That bread of heaven, of course, is the manna that God provided for them. The Bible actually refers to that manna as angel's food. God provides for them in a very wonderful way, provides meat, he provides bread. Not only that, verse 41, He opened the rock. The waters gushed out. And they ran in the dry places like a river. In other words, God is providing every need that His people have. As they leave the land of Egypt, headed to the land that God has promised to them, God is caring for them in a most basic, natural way with the physical food and the water that they need to sustain their lives. That's His provision. And then we're also reminded of His faithfulness. In verse 42 and following, why did God do all of this? Here's the reason. For He remembered. That's why. God remembered. God, God did all of these wonderful things for His people because He remembered His, not just His promise, He remembered His holy promise. He remembered His holy promise and Abraham His servant. And He brought forth His people with joy and His chosen with gladness and gave them the lands of the heathen. And they inherited the labor of the people. That means they, they basically moved into cities they did not build. They, they reaped a harvest from crops they did not plant. They drank from wells they did not dig. They, they benefited from the labors of the people who were, who were in the land that God had given to them. And, and why did God do all of that? Verse 45, that they might observe His statutes and keep His laws. That's why God did it. He wanted to bring them out that He might bring them in to a place of blessing. He brought them out of a place of slavery that He might bring them into a place of freedom. And, and He did all of that so that they might remember who He is and that they might observe all of His commands. That they would obey Him faithfully. That, that's why God did it. That's why God did it. As we consider this psalm, we consider the mighty power of the Lord God at work to save His chosen people. People whom He had chosen to be His own. 
As we see God's mighty power working to save them from a place of slavery, bring them into a place that He had chosen for them, we can certainly understand why David now is going to end this psalm. He's going to end the psalm basically in the same way that he began it. He's going to end it with these words, Praise ye the Lord. You consider all that God has done for us. Consider the great blessings He's bestowed upon us. Consider the salvation that we have received. He's brought us out of Egypt and brought us into a place of great blessing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And you know what? As believers in Christ, we can praise God for the same reasons. In fact, we should praise God for the very same reasons. We should praise Him because we have been chosen by Him. We have been chosen by Him. And one day, one day, John chapter 14, verse 2, verse number 3, one day He's going to personally lead us to our eternal home. So how should we respond to that? Can we all read it together? Let's all read it together. Let's read it together. Praise, come on, praise ye the Lord. Amen? That's exactly how we ought to respond. When we consider how our God has done so much for us.